liver disease. Since 1976, the American Liver Foundation has promoted education, advocacy, support services, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. Education is a major part of our mission, and we thank you for coming today to learn more about liver disease. Liver donation is important to us because we know there are over 12,351 people waiting for a life-saving liver transplant. We developed the Greatest Live Gift Living Donor Liver Transplant Information Center for more information on liver transplant. And we'll put the um, link to that um, later in the chat box so that you can get to that. Um, as many of you know, um, or, or hopefully know by now, there's been some changes with the American Liver Foundation. And I took over the Ohio market uh, or area in July of 2020 this year. I'm the National Engagement Director for the South and my areas include Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. I'm located out of Nashville, Tennessee. And I also wanted to introduce Kat Evans, who serves as our National Engagement Coordinator, and she is based out of Colorado. Kat? Hello, everyone. Um, I know many of you have been on a ton of Zoom calls before this, but I wanted to quickly review just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. This presentation will be recorded and it's going to be housed on our ALF YouTube channel. The link to watch today's presentation will be sent to you in a follow-up email. To keep background noise to a minimum, we just ask that you please mute yourself during the presentation. The little microphone icon on the bottom is used to mute and can be found on the bottom toolbar. After each speaker has presented their topic, we're going to hold a Q&A session. At that time, please feel free to join us by turning your cameras on so you can see you all on level faces. Oh, okay, we're getting a little bit of sound feedback. I think what happened in here. During the Q&A session, feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question. If you prefer to just type in a question, please use the chat box option. The icon is also available in your toolbar. All right, does that sound a little better? Sorry about that, everyone. So during the Q&A session, you can unmute yourself then, um, just so that way we don't get that sound interference like we were just now experiencing. Um, and at any time, we do welcome your participation. So please submit your questions in the chat box at any time, and we're gonna get to them as soon as we can, all right? And we're gonna do our best to address all of your needs. I will now turn it back to Teresa. Thanks, Kat. Um, I just want to um, also thank our sponsors. Um, Bear, Advancing Life, that's what we at Bear are all about. We put ourselves to the test day in and day out, all together, all over the world with enthusiasm for new ideas. And Salix, um, without these sponsors, we wouldn't be able to bring you educational programs and we truly appreciate their support. Um, I love motivational quotes and this is one by Sonia Johnson and it's one of my favorites. It's, we must remember that one determined person can make a significant difference and that a small group of determined people can change the course of history. I think in dealing with transplant, you are fortunate to have a couple of teams, hopefully in your life. You have your personal team of loved ones that support you and you have your transplant team that works with you to help you through the process. I love this quote as I really think it zooms in on the importance of team efforts. Make sure you work with your team to make your experience brighter. We're fortunate to have the following women from um, University of Cincinnati Health Center to help us understand more on improving our health and transplant experience. Many of you know them and work with them already, and some of you may be new to the UC Health team. Lisa Schultz is a registered dietitian, and she will be talking about nutrition care for liver transplant. Tiffany Kaiser is a pharmacist and she will be talking about immunosuppressant therapy. And then Alex G is a psychologist and she will be talking about liver transplant and mental health. We will be giving away Zoomy giveaways at the end of each of the speaker sessions. 
Make sure you have a phone number or you've given us your email address when you registered. If you didn't give us one of those two things, just put it in the chat box for me so that if you're one of the winners of one of the prizes, I know how to get in touch with you to mail you your, your prize. But that's not being together. It's kind of having to go by the mail. So um, you got to give me a week or so to get it to you. Um, all right, I think we're ready to get started. So at this point, um, I'm going to, get to give remote control to Lisa and let her um, start. All right, can you guys hear me? Let's see if I can get this going. Okay, so um, I'm Lisa Schultz, I'm the dietitian, and I just wanna talk about um, nutrition both pre and post transplant. So as far as pre transplant, um, the general guidelines are to follow a low sodium and a high protein diet. Um, and we'll go through a couple of things on the next couple of slides, but I just put some um, general points here. So for low sodium, we generally say you want to aim for 2000 milligrams or less of sodium per day. Um, and if you're looking at food labels, you can kind of start adding up your sodium throughout the day and try to make sure that it's within that limit. Um, you know, you could equally space out your sodium between three meals. So it'd be about 650 to 700 milligrams of sodium per meal if you want to do it equally. Or some people, you know, say you want to have a bigger dinner and you eat kind of a smaller breakfast and lunch. So then you can um, kind of manipulate the numbers. So for example, I put here, have a breakfast of about 400 milligrams, a lunch of 600 milligrams, and then that allows you to have your dinner um, with some more leeway so you can have like a thousand milligrams. So it's really just kind of working with however you um, like to have your meals um, to make sure that you're staying under 2000. Or even some people might, you know, eat five small meals a day instead of just the three a day. So then you would want to divide out those five meals for your 2000 milligrams. Um, when, like I said, we'll go through some other things about low sodium, but as far as high protein, uh, there's no real specific recommendation on like how much you actually have to get. But my general recommendation is just to remember um, at every meal and every snack that you eat, try to get some kind of protein. Um, you can get it through your food, which is typically the best way your body uses the protein in food best, but there are other options like the nutrition supplements. So, um, you know, things listed here, Boost, Ensure, Premier Protein, Pure Protein, and even just using like a plain protein powder um, that you can then make your own protein drink. So all of those are options along with getting food from your, or sorry, protein from your food um, to make sure that you are meeting your protein needs. All right. Did it click? There we go. Okay. So as a general um, rule uh, for sodium, one teaspoon of table salt has 2,300 milligrams of sodium. So that's more than your daily allotment in just one tiny little teaspoon. So that's just kind of hopefully a visual guide to, to know that, you know, you are pretty limited with that 2,000 milligrams, um, but there's ways to get around it and make sure that you still have a good variety of foods that you can eat. Um, within that limitation. So one of the first things you can definitely do is try just to not use the salt shaker when you're eating and trying to leave salt out of recipes. Um, so definitely things like pastas and casseroles and soups, if you're making those at home, you can just withhold the salt. Um, even if it says to add salt for your recipe, just leave it out. And then there are options of trying to add in different spices and other things to make it more flavorful and still taste good. Um, so this is a little bit hard to see, but in the little green box down here, it lists through different food items, and then it lets you know all these different um, spices and flavorings that you can use instead of salt. So, you know, if you are trying to make some fish, and instead of putting salt on there, you could try things like basil and bay leaf, um, you know, even lemon juice, a lot of people put on uh, fish. So there's a lot of options and you can see through all of those that there's just different ones to use instead of the salt. Sorry, my things are not wanting to click through. There we go. Okay. 
Um, also, you want to try to choose fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables instead of canned. Um, if you do have canned, for, uh, you know, say some canned vegetables on hand, you probably can still use them, but we do recommend to at least just rinse them extra and that does get some of the sodium off. Um, so say you have like a can of beans, you can rinse those four or five times and that's going to get rid of some of the sodium um, better than it would be to just use that can. But, you know, if you're going to go out to the store and just get some fruits and veggies, trying to look for those fresh or frozen ones will definitely minimize sodium. The one thing you have to remember is though for frozen vegetables, a lot of times they do have some kind of sauce on there and the sauce could have sodium. So you'll want to just kind of check the food label and see for the frozen vegetables with sauces if it has a lot of sodium or not. Um, trying to choose your meats is, uh, you know, fresh meats is best when you're trying to minimize sodium. So processed meats, things like bacon, sausage, hot dogs, lunch meat, all of those processed meats do tend to be higher in sodium. So trying to keep those to a minimum and just choosing more like fresh cuts of chicken and beef, um, things that have no salt or very minimal salt added. And then you can cook them at home with minimal salt as well. Uh, then definitely trying to limit processed foods, TV dinners, free, frozen pizzas, other frozen meals like frozen chicken pot pie, those kind of things. Unfortunately, they do tend to have a lot of sodium. So definitely try to limit those as well as trying to limit fried foods. Uh, the breading, especially on fried foods, is where a lot of the sodium is. So for, like French fries that are going to have um, sodium in as well as like fried chicken is a common one. That skin on the fried chicken they typically have a lot of sodium in there. And then just some, uh, excuse me, some other common foods that have high sodium are like pickles, olives, relish, and sauerkraut. So really trying to minimize um, using those and eating those. Um, as far as eating out, it can be a little tricky when you're trying to follow low sodium, but you can still do it, you know, trying to just kind of do it sparingly, I guess, um, and then being smart about it when you are out um, to eat. So what you'll want to do is um, maybe look at the food labels, or sorry, the food facts that the restaurants have on their web uh, websites and on their menus. If you can't find that, you can always ask the server. A lot of times they're helpful in making sure to tell the kitchen to minimize the salt that's added, um, and they can even maybe help you find um, what foods on their menu is going to be best you know, choosing things like grilled or baked instead of fried um, meats, that kind of thing. They can hopefully point you to the right things on the menu. Um, and also just trying to remember if you do get a salad, the salad dressing is typically where a lot of sodium is. So ask for that on the side, ask for any sauces on the side. So just trying to work with the server in the kitchen to make sure that you're, you're um, having low sodium there. All right, so I just wanted to briefly go over reading a food label since, um, you know, sticking to the 2000 milligrams of sodium, you'll really want to look at the food labels. So this is an example here, and I tried to circle the important things. So the first thing you want to look for is the serving size, um, because you'll, you know, have to kind of um, calculate your numbers depending on how much you're actually eating. And then also I circled there where it actually says the sodium. So all food labels will list sodium and the milligrams um, per serving on there. So for this one, the serving size is two thirds of a cup and there's 160 milligrams for that serving. So say you actually ate, you know, a cup and a half of whatever this product is. So then you would just need to double your sodium. Um, so you would actually be in taking 320 milligrams if you were to have two servings of that food. So just always remember to look for that, look at the serving size, check the sodium. Uh, most of the time we consider a food to be low sodium if it has 140 milligrams or less of sodium per serving. Um, so that's kind of where you can look at a food product real quick in the store, see that it has, you know, say it has 500 milligrams for the um, serving size that, you know, you would probably want to um, put back and try something else or really use that minimally. Um, definitely look on the actual food products, the front of the product, or even the back or the side somewhere, things that say salt-free, sodium-free, very low sodium, low sodium. They're getting very good about putting things like that on the food products. So it is helpful 
if you're just trying to quickly look through different foods, um, generally you can find something that will be low sodium, sodium free, that kind of thing. So in the store, you can look for those kind of things. All right, so um, talking about high protein, you can definitely do those nutrition supplements, but if you wanna try to get your protein with your foods, there's a lot of different options. The first one everybody usually thinks of is meat. Um, that's definitely a great protein. You can get all different types, chicken, turkey, lean beef, pork, anything like that. Um, fish is also a great protein. Trying to do, again, the fresh fish, um, you can get the canned tuna. That actually tends to be lower sodium. It's going to have a little bit, but you can definitely work that into your, your 2000 allotment for the day if you want some canned tuna. Also, nuts and peanut butter are great, especially for in, in the morning at breakfast time, if you want to have like a piece of toast with peanut butter or as a snack, a lot of people will do crackers and peanut butter or something like that, or maybe an apple with peanut butter. Um, so those are great. The only thing about nuts and peanut butter is you want to check the sodium. A lot of times nuts do come salted, so you'll want to try to find either lightly salted or unsalted nuts. And also peanut butter, it can be um, certain brands have more sodium than others. Um, I have seen some peanut butter actually labeled as low sodium, so you could try to find those. Uh, beans are also a great protein. Um, like I was talking about earlier, if you can choose dry beans, they're, the, they're better than the can just because of the sodium content. But, um, you know, if you do get those canned beans, rinse them extra times, that's going to get some of the sodium off. Um, but you can use beans on a lot of different things, like in chilies and even on salads. Some people just throw some cold beans on there. However you want to use those beans to get the protein. Um, dairy will also have protein. So if you're drinking milk throughout the day, that'll give you some. Yogurt is great. Cheese, cottage cheese. Um, if you do go for yogurt, I typically try to recommend Greek because that is higher in protein. If you don't like the, the texture of Greek because it is a little bit thicker, that's okay. You can still do some of that regular yogurt and you'll get protein as well. Um, but I would say try the, the Greek because it does have a little more. Um, as far as cheese and cottage cheese, the sodium content does vary. Um, Swiss cheese is actually the lowest sodium cheese. So that would be my recommendation if you did want to have like a sandwich or something with cheese, try to get Swiss or um, a lot of like the white cheeses tend to be lower sodium than the yellow cheeses. So trying to get those. But again, look at the food label. You might be able to find um, certain cheeses that are lower. And then the last high protein food is eggs. Definitely can do a lot with eggs. You can have in the morning at breakfast or just throughout the day, snacking on a hard boiled egg. Um, that would be a great way to get some protein in. All right, as far as post-transplant, uh, once you have had your transplant, um, you still do need higher protein intake. Uh, so at that point, you do have a big incision to heal. Protein is definitely gonna help that. So we encourage to continue a high protein intake at least for the first couple of months after transplant. Um, that timeline does depend on your specific case, um, but I would say at least a few months to make sure that you're healing well. Um, trying to get the protein in. After those couple of months, you can kind of um, taper down your protein to a normal level. Um, sodium after transplant, you we do recommend you still watch it just because it is still health, good for your overall health, but you do not have to be as strict as before. So before we were trying to do the 2000 milligrams um, post-transplant, we typically say you can go upwards of like 2,500 to 3,000, somewhere around there, um, if you're still watching your food labels. But, um, you know, it just allows you for a little bit more um, intake afterwards. The other thing post-transplant that we do have to watch sometimes is carbohydrates. Um, you do get put on quite a few medications, and some of those do make your blood sugars a little funny. So um, we work with you to make sure that you're just trying to limit maybe some of those sugary beverages, not trying to eat too much, um, you know, like candies and cakes and those like kind of things all throughout the day. And then with your actual meals, just trying to be um, a little bit aware of how much protein or sorry, how much carbohydrate intake you have per meal. So in the hospital, we typically put you on uh, what we consider like a constant, uh, consistent carbohydrate diet is what I was trying to say. So we just um, allow you a certain amount of carbohydrates per meal, and we can, you know, we definitely work with that to make sure your blood sugars are okay after transplant. 
And then the last thing to remember for post-transplant is food safety. So you are on immunosuppressant medication, and that means you're a little more susceptible to foodborne illness. But if you follow food safety guidelines, then you really have a pretty minimal risk of getting sick from your food. So that's the whole point of food safety is to make sure that you're not going to get sick. Um, and I do have, we'll go over some of the guidelines for food safety in just a second. Um, grapefruit and grapefruit juice interact with one of the medications that you take post-transplant. So we do recommend that you just avoid that altogether. Um, grapefruit juice sometimes is in different juice blends. So we recommend always check your food labels. Um, like Sunny D actually has grapefruit juice in it. So you would need to avoid that. And there's other um, juice beverages that you have to watch and make sure there's no grapefruit juice in. And then just looking for no grapefruit overall too. So like I was saying, you know, you need the high protein for a few months. Um, after that, you can kind of taper down the protein intake. And generally after those couple first months where you're really starting to feel better, we just recommend you go back to a generally healthy diet. So that's kind of, you know, no real restrictions other than your food safety. Um, just trying to make sure that you get a good variety of foods in every day. Um, and I've listed here kind of the different food groups. So definitely getting some lean meats in, um, getting your whole grains, some low fat dairy, and then keeping up with your fruit and vegetable intake. All right, so for food safety, uh, the first thing, definitely good hand hygiene. You know, before you're making anything, before you're eating, always wash your hands. That's going to really help um, just kind of minimize any of that exposure. As far as your foods, you want to avoid raw or undercooked foods. Um, the biggest ones being meat and eggs. Those need to be completely cooked. So, you know, steaks need to be pretty much medium well to well done. And eggs need to be completely cooked through, no runniness there. Um, lunch meat needs to be heated up. So eating a hot ham and cheese sandwich is fine, anything like that. Um, just not eating cold lunch meat. And about 30 seconds in the microwave is going to be enough to get that lunch meat kind of steaming hot. Uh, as far as dairy products and juice, they do need to be pasteurized, which you can just look on the, the food label and it's going to tell you if it's pasteurized or not. Um, like for cheese, it would say in the ingredients made with pasteurized milk or something along, along that line. Um, so just choosing those. One thing to remember, now we're in the fall time, apple cider is actually one of the products you want to make sure is pasteurized. Um, you know, a lot of times if you go to little farmer's market type places, they might have some fresh apple cider and that's not always pasteurized. So you do want to check and make sure if you are going to have any to get the pasteurized kind. Uh, fruits and vegetables, you just want to make sure they're washed, run them under some cold water, use a little brush if you need to, whatever it takes to, you know, get all the little dirt off and everything. Um, even you want to wash like a watermelon, wash the outside of that before you cut into it, just so you're not transferring any dirt into the part where you're actually going to eat. Um, also, you'll want to check for any bruises or bad spots. You know, if you get an apple and it has one of those bad spots, cut it out, eat the rest of the apple. Um, you know, just want to avoid the spot where it might have a teeny bit of bacteria. Also avoid cross-contamination. So that would be like if you're going to cut up some lettuce, um, don't use, uh, sorry, if you're going to cut up some, uh, you know, raw chicken, don't then use that knife to cut up some lettuce. Uh, get a different knife, get a different cutting board, and make sure they're separate so that you're not getting any of that, you know, um, raw chicken onto the lettuce. And then check our expiration dates, you know, keep everything fresh in your fridge. Um, don't let things go past, um, you know, if you're going to have leftovers, make sure it's within the first couple of days, usually about, you know, the first three days is fine. Uh, you don't want to go much past that because um, there's risk again for any little bacteria there that could make you sick. And then the last thing, just remember no buffets, no salad bars, even when there's samples out at the grocery store, try to stay away from that. Um, we're just not sure about the exposure on these kind of foods that are out in public. So um, just avoid that. But in general, you can go to restaurants, order off the menu, make sure things are cooked right and prepared well, and that's fine. Just no buffets or salad bars. All right, any questions? Thank you very much, Lisa. We're now going to switch back to gallery view and see if we have any questions out there from our audience um, regarding our nutrition care for liver transplants. If 
anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself, pop on the video. We'd love to see all your faces and get this uh, room a little bit more interactive. This is a space for you all. I have a few. Do you prefer the uh, the chat or just a live mic? Yeah. A live mic's a whole lot more fun. First of all, <laughs> thanks for putting all this together. It's great to see your faces. Um, I'm starting to get a little tired of all of the Zoom meetings and I miss the whole social thing, but this is better than that. So thanks for doing all this. Um, Lisa, um, when you and I talked last week, you had a great idea when it comes to um, fresh fruits and vegetables. And instead of using like a ranch dip, you recommended the no-fat Greek yogurt. And mm -hmm. um, I took some Mrs. Dash um, uh, herb and onion type of seasoning to it, added that to it, and it's great for carrots and celery and all of that. Um, what I'm really? finding though is if you use a pre-dip mix, your sodium goes out the roof. I mean, even yep. just a tablespoon of that for your Greek yogurt, then you've blown your whole sodium just in a, in a couple of bites. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious if the, the recommended percent of carbs per day with respect to uh, increase in triglyceride levels and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, you know, usually we say 50% carbs um, of your diet should be carbs. With triglycerides, if you're trying to work that, maybe trying to do 45%, even 40%, um, it could be better. So somewhere between 40 to 50% would probably be good. Okay, the next question I had was um, lunch meat. Um, uh, back in the day, we were told not to go to the deli. Uh, we were supposed to act like mm -hmm. we were pregnant, diabetic. Um, and I heard you say that you can microwave the lunch meat for 30 seconds, or you can make like a hot ham and cheese. Is it okay to microwave, mm -hmm. go to the deli and get some sliced turkey, come home, microwave it for 30 seconds, and then put it in the refrigerator and use it like cold lunch meat? So that's kind of a um, gray area. I've actually talked with some other dietitians about this, and there is one of our dietitians that does recommend that, that they say that's fine. I just haven't seen enough research to make sure that that's 100% safe. So my recommendation is to still eat it hot. Um, but hopefully we can get more you know, research and better knowledge, I guess, to make sure um, if that is recommended, then I can definitely let you guys know. But at this point, I'd say eat it hot. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Lisa at this time? You could raise your hand too. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Uh, Douglas, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just uh I, I didn't hear her mention I'm a coffee drinker and is coffee okay to drink for your liver and I know sugar is not good how, how about the coffee creamer <laughs> um so I would say coffee is fine as long as you're not doing an excessive amount so if you're just having a cup or two a day that's definitely okay uh the creamer that's a good question. I mean, it's going to be a little bit higher in fat. So if you're using kind of sparingly, I would say that's fine. Just not trying to do like, you know, half your coffee in creamer kind of thing. Okay, I'll just... Do you I'll use sugar it. substitute? Yeah, actually, I've probably been using too, way too much. Actually, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was say you could definitely do that if you need a little sweetness instead of just sugar, trying to do a little Splenda or something. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Lisa, what about star fruit? Um, I know I, I used to work with a lot of dialysis patients and transplant patients from uh, kidney. Mm -hmm. and they were saying that star fruit was really dangerous for transplant patients and dialysis patients. Do you know so I have heard about the dialysis. Um, as far as I know, you can have star fruit with our medications, but that might be a good question for Tiffany if she knows if that is contraindicated for the immunosuppression. Um, no, no, it's oh. not. In terms of the drug okay. interaction, there's not. Okay. okay, that's what I thought. Anybody else 
Any other questions from our audience today? All right, well, thank you very much, Lisa, for your expertise. I'll now turn it back over to Teresa. Before I switch out, I just wanted to know who's on the phone at um, the 859-371-0148 number. I'm about to do drawings and I just wanna make sure I have the name. <coughs> <clears throat> Can anyone tell me who's on the phone there? Okay. Well, we'll just go on back. <laughs> One more question, Lisa, if I can, before we move. Yeah, go ahead, John. Okay. Um, peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter, if I go to fresh market and grind that myself, does that have sodium in it? No, it shouldn't. Because I would assume they're using just fresh almonds without sodium. Right. So they don't have sodium in them or that's minimal? Very minimal, yeah. In the Thank actual you. nut itself. Okay. All right. Um, well, we're going to go on. There's a couple of things I want to do before we introduce the next speaker. Um, we want to thank our sponsors again, Bear and Salix. Um, Got to keep doing that. You know, that's kind of something I need to do. Um, I also wanted to let you all know about the Virtual Liver Life Walk. That's coming up. Um, it unites the liver community across the country to celebrate, honor, and remember our loved ones affected by liver disease. It allows those affected by liver disease to come together to, at home to build community and raise awareness and funds for the American Liver Foundation. This multi-week virtual experience includes guided self-care practices, family-friendly activities, engaging fundraising challenges, and inspiring video messaging. And it's, it's going to be actually a week from Saturday on October the 24th, and it's going to be a virtual event. Um, and it hopefully will bring the American Liver Foundation community in a safe and healthy environment. And for more information, go to liverlifewalk.org virtual walk. And if you want to join a team, I know that Don and Tracy and Judy are definitely looking for team members. And uh, we will make sure that Don puts it in the chat box what the team um, page to sign up on is. Um, so we'll go next to our Zoomy go giveaways. And I have a Liver Life Walk shirt. And we're gonna give that to Douglas Cheek. And then I have another uh, Liver Life Walk shirt. It's gonna go to uh, Bob Miller. And then I have a tote bag, which is you see there in the center. And that's going to go to Judy Rockton. And then um, that's it for the Zoomy giveaways. But we have more coming, so just stay in touch. And then at the end, I'll draw everybody together to see who gets to get the, um, the flavors um, cutting board, because I only have one of those to give away. All right, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, which is gonna be um, Tiffany Kaiser. Um, and I'm just gonna turn it over to Tiffany and let her get started. Do you have still have? Oh. Yep, yeah, I think so. It, it says I'm viewing, it doesn't look like you shared it yet, or it doesn't okay. say shared yet. Okay, it should now. Yep, now it does, okay. perfect. Okay, let's get going here. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to first start and thank the organizers for the opportunity to join you guys on this uh, program tonight. Let me, there we go. Um, in terms of the agenda, when I was asked to talk on immunosuppressant therapy, I was trying to think of what would be interesting or informative, what would maybe advance your knowledge. Um, I kind of made the assumption that most of you were post-transplant patients, which I recognize many of the names and I think that many of you are. Um, 
So rather than just going through the drugs, what I thought would be maybe interesting is kind of give you a big picture approach and talk about selection. Like, why do we use the medications we use? Kind of give you a little bit of background about how they work, a big picture. And then what do we take into account to individualize it per patient? I think many of the questions I've received most recently are kind of about some other um, agents or variations of the agents we have now to kind of help you understand or see how we look at it as a pharmacist and individualize it. And then lastly, um, just review some management, um, key management um, reminders for you. This here is a timeline, as you can see, and it is across the horizon in the middle of the screen is dates, our dates, and then different drugs. So this is a timeline of immunosuppressant drug development. Um, and you can see it's back from the early 1960s when the, we first started liver transplant all the way through 2015. And there's a couple of new agents. Um, some of the agents are you know, not used in liver and they're in other organ transplants. Um, sorry, I might get my... Um, the ones I have the green box there are the standard three drug regimen that we use post liver transplant at, at, in Cincinnati and really probably 95% of all centers in the United States use these same agents steroids, tacrolimus, and mycophenolate mofetil, which is abbreviated MMF. Um, these drugs, the way we think of the drugs is they're categorized or classified according to different classes. And these classes are based on their mechanism of action or their function. So again, they're immunosuppressants. They all work by suppressing the immune system, but the way in which they do this varies. So um, you have different classes, as I have listed here, calciurnin inhibitors, anti-metabolites, corticosteroids, mTOR inhibitors, co-stimulation blockers, and antibodies. You'll see in the now green, you see tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and methylprednisolone. I highlighted the wrong one here. I meant to do prednisone. Methylprednisolone is just the IV form of prednisone. But the point here I want to illustrate is these three drugs that are our backbone for immunosuppressants are of different drug classes. So they belong to a different class. We're going to take this a little bit further and look at this cartoon. We'll step through it. This cartoon is illustrating our immune system or cells within the immune system. What happens normally is an antigen, which is a foreign particle, a foreign material, something our body, your own body recognizes as foreign. It's not yours. And it stimulates the immune system to attack it, right? Try to get rid of it. Um, that's what happens in the setting of rejection. On this cartoon, you see all these pretty colors up here. And you can see it's trying to show specificity. So if you think of this like a lock and a key, right? Only certain keys for, fit certain locks. Well, that's kind of what happens here. We have all of these things that must happen. Um, there may be just one thing that has to happen or 2,000 things that have to happen, but all kinds of paths or all kinds of steps within this cascade in order to stimulate the immune system and make it work. The reason I'm showing you this is all of this detail are really the targets for our medications or our drugs. Our drugs are attacking certain parts of this immune system to turn it down and stop it from working as well as it can. So let me go back here. Sorry, I'm not doing too good with this pointer or slide advancer. So right here, this green X is at calciurnin. So the drugs that we talked about or that I mentioned the first class is calciurnin inhibitors. That's tacrolimus. It works right here. It inhibits calciurnin. So that means this downstream process is inhibited and not working as well. The next drug, steroids, they inhibit IL-2 or interleukin-2, and they work here within this cascade. And the next is mycophenolate, and it works here at nucleotide synthesis or anti-metabolites. It's the cell cycle. Again, the detail isn't important, but I just think sometimes having a better understanding through such illustrations like this, we're selecting these medications because they work at specific points. We're selecting them because they are working at different points. They're not all doing the same thing. Their ultimate task is to decrease how well our immune system works, but they do so in different mechanisms. Additionally, we pick these drugs and we say it's evidence-based. And what we mean by evidence-based is that it's a practice that we've evaluated. 
It's been done research. There's clinical trials. We have data to show that they work. So we have data to show that these medications are effective in suppressing the immune system. They're infect- effective to prevent rejection. We don't just pick them, you know, because we like the name or, you know, if this one costs way less than this one, but it doesn't work, we're not going to select that. So it's evidence-based. The other very important aspect and what especially as pharmacists we think about is by selecting these medications, we really want to achieve a balance. So you can see my balance here and I'm balancing effect and tech- toxicities. So effect, that's how well the drug works, right? So if I have too little or not enough drug, I would say that you're under immunosuppressed. So the effect of the drug isn't as high as it should be. And in this setting, you're going to be more likely to have a rejection. You're, it's going to be more likely that your immune system is going to work as it normally would, be stimulated, attack that antigen or that transplanted liver tissue, and you could have a rejection. The other side of my balance is on the toxicity side. So if I give you too much drug, you may be over immune suppressed. If I make your immune system not work at all, I'm getting you at more risk for infections. Um, And I'm also giving you too much drug, so potentially giving you more toxicities, side effects, adverse effects. So trying to achieve this balance is key. However, as I'm sure you can think about, how I do this per person or how we do it per person varies, right? Everybody's balance is different. And that's kind of what I want to focus on today is how do we individualize this therapy for each patient? We have generalities that we use, but how do we individualize it? And there's a lot of things that we take into account. Many of you may know this when we talk to you in clinic, we talk about some of this, but often this is things that we're doing behind the scenes and still, you know, checking and verifying and your team is doing this all the time when we're evaluating your medications. So one of the first things are your laboratory results, right? Of course, we're monitoring your liver function, what's happening with your liver, but we're also looking at your kidney function. Some medications might need adjustment based on what your kidney is doing. We look at other cell counts, like your white blood cell count. So your laboratory results are very important. Um, Even though I've mentioned we select the drugs and give you three main drugs, how we modify the drugs, how we change the doses um, is really based on this individual individualization part, including your laboratory results. Also physical assessment. And what I mean by this is when you're in the office and we're talking with you, getting information from you on a video visit, how are you doing Um, early after transplant, looking at your wound? um, Are you having any tremors? Are you having headaches? All of this goes into our our, um, account on what we're gonna do with your medications, as well as your time post-transplant. Um, Depending on how far after transplant each of you are, hopefully you remember that first month you were on a lot more medicine, immunosuppressant medication, than you are if you're 12 months out or two years out. In the early part, your risk for rejection is much higher. Your immune system knows there's something foreign or something in your body that it wants to try to get rid of. Um, As time goes on, it gets more used to that and we're able to decrease your immunosuppression over time. How much we can decrease it? Of course, individually, right? Individualized, it depends, every patient's different. And then patient characteristics, and this is very important. Your patient characteristics is your age. How do you take your medications? Do you always take them 12 hours apart? Does that matter? The other thing that's really important are What's your history? Have you ever had a rejection before? If you did have a rejection, was it because you missed a dose of medication? Was there a reason we can find for why you may have had a rejection? Oftentimes not. It could be that we just didn't have enough medication for you, right? Your immune system wasn't suppressed enough. So if you have a history of a rejection, that may tell us you need more. Other things in patient characteristics are, how does the drug work in your body? Um, when we take drugs, they're broken down or metabolized through our liver, through our kidney. In our livers, we all have different enzymes and we have a different amount. The way they work is different. So we may say that some enzyme systems, some people are high metabolizers, others are slow metabolizers. So think if your body metabolizes or breaks down or chews up medication quickly, you may need more. If you do it slowly, you may need less. 
So there's a lot of individual characteristics that take into account of how we would manage or modify your medications. The next are side effects. And this one I want to spend a little bit more time on because this is where I get more questions about some of the other medications. So when I say side effects, we all know every drug has side effects. When you pick it up from the pharmacy, you get a huge list of side effects. A transplant patient can be on 20 medications. If you're on 20 medications, most likely nine or 12 are gonna have headache listed as a side effect. So when you take a lot of medications, you can have a combination or cumulative, right? Your headache could be much worse because you're on lots of medications that could cause a headache. Also, because you're on so many medications, it may be that you have a side effect that we don't even know. It was never put on that list, right? Because you're that one person that's on that combination, that unique combination of 12 medicines at these doses, and your side effects could be different. So what do we do? What do we do when we have side effects? Well, again, remember my number one goal is to achieve that balance. I wanna make sure that I'm giving you enough medicine to suppress your immune system so you don't have a rejection, but I wanna minimize your side effects. So I'm looking for that balance. So there's some things we have to take into account when we're talking about side effects and how to treat them. So we're going to step through this example. So tacrolimus, side effects, let's say that we have some. What are our options to treat them? The first thing, or not, these aren't necessarily in order, but one of the options is to initiate therapies to treat symptoms. So if you have a headache, we may initiate Tylenol to help treat your headache. If you have diarrhea, um, maybe we'll give you a medication to help with your diarrhea. Another option is to avoid medications with similar symptoms. So if you have multiple medications that could give you a headache, maybe there's some we could stop or maybe you shouldn't take. This is one of the reasons we tell you and post-transplant patients not to take ibuprofen or use NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So that's ibuprofen, Motrin, that class of drugs because the way that drug is metabolized or broken down in your body through your kidneys, it kind of works the same way that tacrolimus does on your kidneys. So you have an additive negative impact on your kidney. So we tell you not to take it. Another option is to modify your immunosuppressant regimen. And this we're gonna kind of step through um, some four, uh, about four examples or options. And this is gonna kind of illustrate some of the other um, changes to medications that, you know, I get questions about. So first, this is the simplest one. You're on two drugs or three drugs or four drugs, but in terms of your immunosuppressants, if you're having a side effect, we may be able to decrease the dose of one and increase the dose of the other. The reason we would need to increase the dose of the other is to make sure that total amount of immunosuppression you have is enough. Sometimes we're able to do this and we can make this small adjustment and monitor, look at your labs, your liver's okay with it, and we are able to do that. Another option is to change the drug formulation. So a drug formulation is a process in pharmaceutics and making medications. Different chemical substances, including the active drug, are combined to produce a final product. Easiest way, I think, to think about this, we all can think of the difference between a solid and a liquid. Those are different formulations. Um, but in drug manufacturing, you could have differences in a solid. Um, I think one of the easiest examples, and when you asked the question earlier um, on coffee, let's say you have a cup of coffee and you have a sugar cube. And if you put your sugar cube in your cup of coffee, that sugar cube could dissolve, let's say, in 20 seconds. But you could buy a different sugar cube, and maybe it takes an hour to dissolve. You get another one, and it takes two hours. So the formulation or the way that sugar cube is made can be changed to allow that sugar to release quickly, intermediate, or slow, or more slowly. So this is what we think about with tacrolimus. The immediate release, tacrolimus is Prograf. This was, um, came to market in the mid 80s. We've used it for many, many years. You take it twice a day and you take it every 12 hours because of the way the medication works. You take it. It goes into your mouth, into your bloodstream. It gets a peak, and over time, it comes down in 12 hours, and you repeat it in 12 hours because of the way the drug works in your body. More recently, in the last five years or so, there have been some 
changes in formulation, and we have extended release formulation. And there's different products, Invarsis, Astagraph, and LCPT Tacro. These drugs are taken once a day because the formulation is changed and they dissolve, if you will, or they release into your bloodstream over 24 hours. So that's a different in formulation. I'm going to try to make my point by showing you a graph and we'll explain it. Um, but I think this was the easiest way um, to, to, to demonstrate this. So we'll step through it. Along the bottom here is time and hours. And over here, this is a concentration. So what we call these are concentration curves. So basically each line is reflecting the concentration or the amount or the level of the drug in your body over time. So the first we're gonna look at is this green line, which is IR TAC or intermediate release TAC, which is Prograph, which is the one you take twice a day, which is the one we've used for, whoops, 20 some years. If you look here, you have, you take the medication, it peaks up in your blood, comes down over 12 hours, and then you get another peak. Yes, the second peak is not as pronounced as the first peak. This is what we know with the medication. Often it's because you're often fasted and have nothing in your body here, and here you have food from the day. There's different reasons, but that's common what we see. However, if you look at the yellow line and the blue line, these are both extended release. So often we think extended release, you take it once a day, it's the same thing. Well, right here, this is showing and illustrating they're not the same thing. They don't act the same way in our body. The yellow drug, it increases up kind of like that twice a day prograph, the green line. And then over time, it comes down. The blue, you can see it peaks up. But look, this peak is not at all as much as this. And then it comes down. So the point is, changing a formulation may be a way or changing from one formulation to another may be a way to help with some side effects. However, we must remember it's the same drug. We're not getting rid of the drug. It's the same drug. If we can figure out that you're having a simple, a certain side effect related to this two hours after you take it, maybe switching to a once a day that has a lower amount at that time may help. But oftentimes we don't. And these curves are, are estimates of many, many people. Each one of you has a different curve and a different that. So changing a formulation changes how the drug is released or works within your body, but it's the same drug. So it may not be a fix. The next option. Is to switch to a different CNI. And the CNI is just the abbreviation for calcineurin inhibitors. So remember that cartoon we had in the beginning where Prograph or Tacrolimus inhibited calcineurin. If we switch to a different one, the other one in the class is called cyclosporin. Some of you may be familiar with it. Cyclosporin as well as Tacrolimus are both calcineurin inhibitors. They both function, act on the immune system, to inhibit calcineurin. So they're in the same class. I don't know what I'm doing here. I keep having trouble with turning this. Just a second. So um, this, to think about switching between calcineurin inhibitors. It's the drug within the same class. Um, and the only information we have that compares to Crolimus and cyclosporin in liver population is published in 1997. And it's three-year outcomes of patients published in 1997, which means they were transplanted in the early 1990s. So that means it was 30 years ago. Um, transplant has changed in 30 years, the surgical procedures changed, the care for patients has changed, and how we use medications has changed. The reason I point this out is this is our only way to compare these two calcineurin drugs in data, evidence-based, as we talked about. Um, however, it was a long time ago, and a long time ago when we used these medications, we used much, much more than what we use now and what we would call our modern-day immunosuppression. 
So a table with a lot of numbers, but I'll explain it. Again, this is co comparing adverse events or side effects, and they're listed here. Nephrotoxicity is kidney dysfunction or you know harmful to your kidneys. Neurotoxicity means it impacts your nerves, and the one we most commonly think of are tremors. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Post-transplant diabetes is the impact it can have on increasing your blood sugars. Hyperlipidemia and hypercholesteremia are just increases in cholesterol in different parts of your cholesterol panel. Alopecia is hair loss. Pertuism is hair growth. And gingivitis is um, swelling or inflammation in your gums. This is tacrolimus. There was 205 patients. And this is cyclosporin. There was 207 patients. Key, as I said, 30 years ago, the targets of this TAC were 15 to 20 early after transplant. Prednisone was a high dose for long term. So lots more immunosuppression. I will figure this out probably by the time I'm done with this. Um, so here in red are the, are the side effects that were more prominent in those on cyclosporin, tremor, diabetes, or increased blood sugar, and hair loss compared to cyclosporin, hair growth, and inflammation in your gums. So you see differences. My point of explaining it and using data to kind of illustrate is that long ago, we were able to see some differences between these two medications. However, it was 30 years ago when we used the drugs differently and much, much higher amounts and achieving higher target levels of these drugs. However, today, it's potential or possible that there could be a slight difference in some of these side effects. However, they are in the same class. They're both calcium inhibitors. So we may still experience some of the side effects, but in some cases and in some patients, depending on the situation, this is something that we may try, switching from tacrolimus to cyclosporin. The last option um, that we think about with side effects or, or addressing side effects is adding an alternate drug, something different. And again, this is another, med another question that I've gotten recently. Um, these are the three drugs, the tacrolimus, the steroids, and the mycophenolate that we talked about that are our standard medications after transplant. Another class of drugs are called the mTOR inhibitors. And mTOR is just the mammalian target of rapamycin. So, of course, saying mTOR is easier. Um, and it inhibits this pathway, again, suppressing the immune system, but by a different way. Function is different. And these medications are um, sirolimus and everolimus. And we add these on to minimize, so decrease the amount of the calcium inhibitor. So we would add it to minimize how much tacrolimus we may give you or to get rid of it completely. However, it's important to realize it is a different drug. It has a different mechanism. It works differently as we just looked at. There's different criteria for use. For example, um, some of the side effects are that it can elevate um, lipids or cholesterol panels. Um, it impairs wound healing. So early after transplant, we wouldn't use it. So Criteria for use, meaning if somebody has high cholesterol, this may not be something we could start. We may have to treat the cholesterol, then start it. Um, and in terms of monitoring, it's monitored different. There's some other labs and things we have to do. So it is an option. Um, but again, because it works differently, it's a different class of drugs. It kind of has its own, um, own rules for use and its own symptoms or criteria. So I just, like I said, I know we know side effects are important. We kind of stepped through that we could increase um, maybe or ways to treat it would be to decrease the dose of one drug, but increase another. We could try a different formulation because the properties of how the drug works within the body change. So maybe that could make a difference. We could switch from um, one calcium inhibitor to another or potentially add another agent. We don't have lots of other agents um, to add, but the mTOR inhibitors or everolimus is one um, that we can try. Some other things to think about in terms of selection are your other medical conditions and or medications. Of course, um, that may have some interactions or 
increased side effects, the things that we need to consider. And finally are things like your insurance formulary. And what that means is your insurance may say, we prefer this drug over that, and that's the one we want you to use first. And of course, cost. Um, we're at a point now where we have many generic medications, um, and it, it has significantly decreased the cost um, rather than dealing with brand, um, but that is something we definitely consider. Again, balancing. This is kind of what we think about with everything we do. Anytime we are individualizing your therapy, anytime we make a change, we are, in essence, um, putting a risk at this balance. You know, the saying, don't rock the boat. So sometimes anytime we make a change, we could rock it and potentially offset the balance. A few pointers, just a reminders in terms of medication management to finish up. As you know, immunosuppressive therapy is required for life and it must be taken exactly as prescribed. Um, you know, it's not made up, it's evidence-based. The drugs are prescribed and asked to take a certain way because of the way that they work, right? If they only are effective and have enough level in your body for 12 hours, that's why you take it every 12 hours. If enough drug can be there for 24 hours, that's why you only take it once a day. Some common things though are, what if I miss a dose? This is a common question that we get. And, uh-oh, um, just give me one second. Okay, so what if you miss a dose? Um, we don't have tons of data to go and look or research clinical studies to say, what happens if I'm three hours late, four hours late? We do know within an hour that usually it doesn't, it's not problematic. So as a rule of thumb, we usually say within one to two hours, it's okay to take it. If it's more than that, we really want you to give us a call because we want to kind of figure out for you specifically what's the best um, answer. Sometimes it's not just that you're missing it and you are then not having enough immunosuppression on board, but if you miss it, or try to take it too close to when the next dose is due, you could be adding that toxicity or increasing the side effects because you're kind of doubling up on the dose. So calling us is, is really what we want you to do if it's more than two hours. And then if you forget and take your medications prior to your blood level or your lab test, again, we want you to call and let us know because we're gonna see that level and most likely it's gonna be a lot, lot higher because you just took the medicine. Um, and we don't want to make a dose adjustment on a level that's not a true level. So just as a reminder, if you take your medications at 8 in the morning and 8 in the evening, when would you draw your trough or when do you get labs? We want you to get them right before the dose is due. So if you took it at 8 p.m. at night, you're going to get your labs right before 8 o'clock in the morning. Just to show you, if you were to get your labs too early, like at 5 in the morning, if this is the concentration or the value um, let's say this level is five, then this level could be 10 or this level could be two. So it throws it off. And it's why by convention, we just want it to be a 12 hour trough. So it's important that you take it as directed. Reminding again, tools. We give you some right after transplant as you're further out from transplant, how you manage and what works for you. We don't care. We just want you to have a system. We know and data shows that having a system helps you stay in a routine, follow, take them as prescribed. So taking and using tools or multiple tools is encouraged. There are apps, um, there's many. Um, MediSafe and Transplant Hero um, are two that um, I'm more familiar with. I actually have them set myself to try to use. Um, they give reminders. Um, the thing I like about them is in addition to an alarm as a reminder, like, hey, it's eight o'clock, I need to take my medicine. You also have to click and say, yes, I took it. So it has that accountability. So it's like a second step. If you don't click on it until you take it, it helps you not miss a dose. Specialty pharmacies, um, many of you may use a specialty pharmacy or, or know what it is, but for those that don't, a specialty pharmacy is a type of pharmacy. It's a state licensed pharmacy. And it really provides medications for people with serious health conditions requiring complex or long-term therapies. So I listed all the different types and you can see organ transplant is one of them. 
there are some things and requirements or regulations that these pharmacies have to follow in order to obtain and then maintain their state licensure. Um, they call, they, they help with, um, you know, financial assistance, and they, they do many, many, many wonderful things and really complement and work with your transplant team. I have a bunch listed. There's all kinds, and we have one at UC Health, and I know many of you use, but specialty pharmacies are very much a great tool to help uh, manage your medications. And just the last thing I want to point out, there are many resources, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, obviously, with the American Liver Foundation and educational sessions like this. Also, with UNOS on their site, they have a lot of information. This is on um, AST, which is the American Society of Transplantation. This site is www.myast.org. In the last probably two years, but more so in the last year, they've added this for patients on their website. If you click on this and then you'll see these options and if you go to transplant learning, um, it, it comes down to a whole bunch of things. And I mean, they have videos, they have a series called Transplant in 10 video series. There's a 10 minute video on medications. There's a 10 minute video on immunizations and it's geared towards patients. So it's in your, you know, a language and delivery to you so you can understand what, what's happening or what they're talking about and has key reminders and important information in 10 minutes. So here, like I said, I was just doing this to show pre-transplant, post-transplant. Post-transplant has tons of information and it has this medicines to keep your new organ healthy. This is a 10 or sorry, like a 20 page booklet. It goes through medications. It gives you some reminders. It's easy to use. It was done in 2018 and I think, you know, went on the site last year. But again, just a great site. Um, I wasn't sure if people were familiar with it. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, so we've reviewed lots of things. Again, I tried to think of a way to talk about it in a little different approach. I think sometimes understanding um, and having an appreciation for kind of why it's these drugs and then what we do to kind of individualize it for you. Many of you may have questions or, hey, this person's on this. Why am I not on it? Or, oh, is this the same as that? So I kind of wanted to address that by stepping through and give you some um, examples. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very uh, much. We're now going back to switch back to the gallery view uh, and open up the floor for any questions. I have a question. Sure. Uh, on the pharmacy, yes, okay. On the pharmacy thing, I'm I, a retired military. Uh -huh. So 90% of my drugs are coming from the VA or Wright Patterson. Uh -huh. Do they have that type of setup? I, I do not believe so. They, as you know, with the VA, it's a closed system and it's all within. So they're doing it within their own pharmacies. Um, do you ever get additional phone calls to check in, not when you need a refill or anything from those people at that pharmacy? The VA automatically sends them to me. And then at mm -hmm. right, Pat, I got to call it in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, specialty, because like I said, it's through a state licensure and how you go about it. And they kind of contain that within the VA. Okay. So I have to work with them. So it's not. Yep. Yep. Okay. Most likely, because your insurance, your insurance and your prescription insurance is kind of mandating what pharmacies you use. And that's why, like you said, 90% of your medications are coming from there. Yeah, and they're free. And they have immunos they ha yeah, and they have immunosuppressants. I yeah. know right here we don't do transplants here, but at the other ones that do and they carry them. So yeah, they're gonna have you get them from them. Okay. No problem. Thank you. A, a statement. Uh -huh. Other question? Um I um I, I have, well, I did have a really bad reaction to Prograph. And um, it took the team a few days to figure out. And I don't, I never have seen that listed as a sign, but it's, I'm not the only person it's ever happened to. And it made me, um, instead of the kind, sweet person I am, very aggressive and combative. And um, it was a really bad experience. And a lot of the people here already know about it. So I won't go into the details, but I just, that kind of, I mean, I don't want to put it in people's head that that's going to happen, but 
if that's if mania starts, then it may look to the program. Or that's my opinion. And I did get and, and Judy born and that works really well. And Judy, was this this was early after transplant? Yeah, within well, I, I was transplanted in February and it happened in April. Yeah. I was on yeah. it for two and months and, before it happened. Yeah. And that's where, you know, it's, it's a lot of things in those first few months. And that's where kind of when I talked about being on so many medications, you can often have a cumulative effect. So there are other medications that can do that too, right? So when you take them in combination, or as we start to change or taper or change doses and things like that, absolutely. And you can have things sometimes that are not listed, but could potentially be related to something. Well, as soon as they took me off the program, like I was fine in 24 hours, mentally. Right. There's um, more style on that question. Shut. Yeah. So, Don. so, and, and Judy, the one thing about ProGraph is, you know, it, it gets kind of lumped as neurotoxicity. So that's just the saying it impacts nerves. Nerves can be the tremors, which people, you know, know, tingling yeah. in the feet, headaches, but nerves can also be through your mind confusion, a lot of those types of symptoms, we just, it, it's lumped as neurotoxicity because it's often hard to differentiate them to study them that way. So, you know, kind of what you're describing is kind of under potentially that bucket or that term okay. neurotoxicity. But yeah, I'm glad that you're, I'm glad that you're doing better. Oh, my yeah. liver and kidney are doing great. I've been having um, a bad cough and congestion for like six months or more and the cardiac Shortness of breath, huge shortness of breath. The cardiologist has worked up everything, says there's nothing more he can do. Sent me to pulmonology. They didn't find, but they finally sent me to an interventional pulmonologist. Just today, I had a, and he said they got a lot of junk out of the lower lobes of both lungs. It is infection of some kind. They to the fact that I'm on presence and I didn't and my body didn't attack these particular infections have you ever heard of that before um yeah so not I mean not specifically in your case because we don't know what it is but absolutely because your body is immunosuppressed you definitely are less able to fight off infections so you know early post-transplant you were on medication. So you were on antiviral, antibacterial, and potentially an antifungal. And that's because we're lowering your immune system on purpose and saying, you're not going to be able to attack infection. As time goes on, even though you're on less medicine, you're still immunosuppressed. So you're definitely have less or a turned down immune system compared to somebody not on immunosuppression. So you could be at a higher risk of, you know, particular types of infections. It just, it took people like six months to figure out that that is what was. And, and I don't have a fever. I don't have any sort of infection except lower lobes of my, or a CT scan, they see junk in the lower lobes. And I'm just really glad somebody finally decided to go down in there and get a specimen and see what it is. So out either quickly if it's a regular bacteria or if it's some kind of weird one he said it could take up to six months to figure it out so i'm i hope they can find something to treat it because i don't want to keep coughing up junk all day every day thanks sure anyone else other questions so i'm, I'm sensitive yes. to to time for, for Dr. Alex, but Dr. Kaiser, um, a couple of things. Um, most of us on the transplant side of things, near and dear to our heart is digestive issues. And um, one of the things that people recommend are like probiotics, probiotics and getting your gut bacteria all in check. But when I look at those, they all say that they boost your immune system. And isn't that counterproductive to what we're trying to do? Like broccoli and kale yeah. and uh, blueberries and all these things that boost your immune system. 
So, so yes, but I think that the challenge, or at least my challenge in interpreting those types of statements is there isn't necessarily lots of data to describe what that means, boosting your immune system. So we've had patients use it. I think our hepatologists, some are okay with it. Others will say, I don't really know if it does anything. I don't know if you want to use it. But in terms of boosting, um, there's no concrete data necessarily to say exactly how it does it. If yes, we had something to say, it absolutely increased your immune system. If you were to be on a therapy like that, we would maybe have to decrease some of the um, anti-rejection medications you were on, or we would have to monitor different or things like that. But we don't really have data to specifically describe what that statement means or statements like those mean. Okay. And then lastly, um you know, being alpha one antitrypsin deficient, unfortunately, I've passed that on to three of my kids. Um, is mm -hmm. there something besides seeing their geneticist that they should be doing pharmacologically uh, with, you know, I don't know, over the counter stuff or, or maybe we can do that offline. Again, I'm, I'm sensitive um, to Dr. Alex's. No, no, no. I understand my, my answer is no. I don't know of anything that they can do. I think having routine follow-up and monitoring is is what you can do. I mean, there's no like, you know, pill or magic this or that to help with it that I'm aware of. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. If you have any other questions, if you want to put them in the chat, I can answer them um, while Alex is talking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. All right, so we're now going to switch back um, and we're going to, I'm going to hand this over to Teresa. Thanks, guys. Before we get to Dr. G, there's a couple more things I need to go over. Hold on, and we had a couple extra slides here. Oh, okay. Um, first, we need to see this slide. Right now, millions of patients are suffering with GI disorders such as overt hepatic encephalopathy, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic idiopathic constipation, opioid-induced constipation, bowel preparation, and ulcerative colitis. At Salix, we have kept up with these unmet needs for more than 30 years by providing an industry-leading portfolio of high-quality products that address these conditions. Through our dedicated and innovative R&D team, we're also exploring potential new scientific breakthroughs. And we remain committed to important healthcare provider investments in education, charitable grants, and sponsorships. We will continue to invest millions of dollars in patient education and do our best to broaden access to Salix medications. Because our mission to improve the care for GI patients continues today. For us, there is no finish line. Okay, that was something brought to us by one of our sponsors, Salix. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you all about was our Cuisine for a Cause. I don't know if you all have attended a Flavors event or a Cuisine event, um, but while we can't serve up incredible food this year because of COVID, we're excited to host our first ever virtual culinary event. It's going to be November the 21st, and we'll bring you our first ever Cuisine for a Cause. Um, the virtual event will offer unique local and national engagement opportunities for the liver community and is sure to excite all the foodies in all of us. There'll be two seasoned top chefs and they'll come into your kitchen with a fun and interactive cook along and you'll get inspired to follow step-by-step -step instructions from the cooks or from the chefs and prepare a HelloFresh signature dish alongside them. VIP tickets are being sold now um, through the end, um, probably towards the end of the month. Um, and it includes six meals from HelloFresh and two of those are um, from each of the different chefs. So uh, just check out our website at www.alfcuisine.org. Um, now it's time to draw a few more zoomies. So I'm gonna draw those. And we have a Liver Life Walk t-shirt for John Mock. And we have another one, and it is a liver wife walk t-shirt for Sandy Cheek. And then I have a $10 Chick-fil-A card, which I hope that you don't get fried chicken there. You get grilled chicken there. Um, and that is for Barry Johnson. So that takes care of those for this time. So it, 
this time, I'm ready to give everything over to Dr. G. Um, and she's going to be talking about liver transplant and mental health. So Dr. G, let me make sure that you are have remote control. Can you hear me, oh. Teresa? Yep. You should okay. be able to take the screen and go with it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. You're Good welcome. evening, everyone. Uh, it is really nice to safely see some unmasked faces and familiar faces. Um, thank you, Kat and Teresa and Lynn and everyone for having me tonight. Um, I uh, am always excited to have a chance to come uh, to a group and talk about um, mental health and transplant. Um, I think historically it's not been something that we've always done a great job of acknowledging. Um, uh, as a part of this process. Um, and so definitely at UC, we're trying to do a better job of um, normalizing the this piece of the process, um, talking about it more and making sure that our patients have the resources that they need um, to, uh, to move through this process successfully, not just physically, but from a mental health standpoint as well. Trying to move to the next slide. Let's see here. There, oh, went too far. Okay, so I, include, I included this image uh, today um, just basically to kind of highlight um, what I would like to say is perception versus reality in terms of how folks move through this process. Um, so that red line there, uh, you'll see um, is kind of how I think we've been taught to think that it, it feels to go through uh, the transplant process, both physically and mentally, um, that at the time of diagnosis, and then as one gets sicker with end-stage liver disease, that um, you start to feel worse physically, um, and also at times mentally, um, down to the point of the, the bottom of that um, dip, um, where the transplant happens. And then I think the thought oftentimes is that uh, everything is uh, sunshine and rainbows from there on. And, and um, there's a smooth and straight line recovery up to um, previous level of functioning, um, which uh, would be a nice idea. Um, but I would say more often than not, that is not how this process goes. There is so much up and down, um, both again, physically uh, and mentally and emotionally that goes along with this process from time of diagnosis to all of the evaluation and testing processes. Um, all the while symptoms may be getting worse, um, you may be getting sicker. Um, then you have your surgery and, and again, um, there are plenty of challenges that come along with both the early and long-term recovery processes. There are complications in the hospital. There are bumps in the road um, down the line that have to uh, be addressed. Um, and along with that comes some up and down in, in how you're feeling overall in mood. Um, and, and sometimes there's some, some depression and anxiety and other types of mental health responses that come along with that. And so I just include this slide because I think it's important to normalize that this, this is more the common course than um, just this kind of clear straight line um, up and through recovery. It's, it's a roller coaster for a lot of our patients. And um, I think just acknowledging and knowing that that's the reality of the matter can be um, super helpful as we're uh, working folks through and as you're as you're going through the recovery process. So I know we're a little close on time. So I want to, um, I'm going to do my best to respect everyone's uh, time and get us um, finished up. But um, so this slide is uh, just uh, gives us some data on rates of depression and anxiety in the uh, patient population. Um, so as you can see here in the general population, about seven to 10 percent of folks will um, meet criteria for an episode of depression in their lifetime. Um, that data is about, or the percentage is about 10 to 15% um, for meeting criteria for uh, an anxiety disorder. Those numbers jump up significantly when it comes to patients who have been diagnosed with end-stage liver disease. As you see there, 60% for depression, 20 to 30% for um, meeting criteria for an anxiety disorder. Um, and so obviously there is a clear mental health um, impact of going through any kind of chronic uh, or long-term or life-threatening potentially illness. Um, 
And then also, like I said, they're on the one year post transplant side, those numbers remain elevated. And so it's not just a, you get your transplant and um, things are, are sunshine after that. It's, it's a long recovery. Um, there are, um, there can be feelings of guilt. There can be um, other symptoms or challenges as, as some of our patients were, were talking about already that come along with that recovery process and medication reactions. And so um, it's important that we as a community are acknowledging these things so that we can help our patients um, and help you guys get the help that you need if you're having any of these concerns. So this is certainly not an exhaustive list of some of the common symptoms that we're looking for as a transplant team. Um, and also uh, as uh, we want you as patients to be looking out for these things as well as loved ones and support providers. Um, as you can see, some of these symptoms overlap with um, with what, um, what the disease looks like. Uh, and so um, things like fatigue, poor sleep, changes in appetite, it can be hard to tease apart what's what um, when it comes to that. Uh, and so that's why we, um, we need to be doing a better job as a team, um, our, our providers, our social workers, myself, of looking out for these things so that we can um, step in and intervene um, when, uh, when help is needed. Because not only does this affect our patient's quality of life, but it affects how one is able to take care of themselves physically, manage their medications. Um, and so it affects how your, your new liver does um, over the long term as well. Um, this is an idea that I talk about uh, with a lot of patients. Um, I, I came up with this, this name, the coping dream, but I'm sure it's something that a bunch of, a lot of mental health providers talk about. Um, so what I think, one of the things that I think is most challenging and probably contributes to those higher rates of depression and anxiety um, for our transplant patients is that um, you are diagnosed with this, um, this liver disease, which comes along with a lot of symptoms um, and a lot of limitations and challenges. And then also along with that, what we need in times of stress and challenge are um, to lean more heavily on our coping strategies and coping tools that we have. And sometimes those things are also taken away by the liver disease or may have been um, in some cases, if they're less adaptive or less healthy coping strategies, they may have been taken away as a result of um, being diagnosed with the, uh, with the liver disease. So things like you know, eating an unhealthy meal or um, maybe uh, having a drink or using other substances. Those are things that obviously are no longer allowed because um, we're, we're trying to get you healthy and, and recovered from the liver disease, but also healthier coping strategies that you may use regularly. Things like vigorous exercise, or you may love to travel or, or just the ability to kind of get out and be independent. A lot of those things are taken away, at least during the short term, or at least during uh, in a way that you may be used to using those things. And so what I'm often working with patients on is how do we fill that gap? How do we balance those scales back out so that you have the opportunity and the ability to, um, to cope with the, the real significant stress that comes along with dealing with an end-stage liver disease? And then, of course, right now we add on top of it the limitations that come along with COVID and and it really um, can be create a tricky imbalance um, that we really need to, to work on sorting out. I like this slide just because it shows us what happens inside our body when we're in a state of chronic stress versus when we are engaging our relaxation response. So as you see there on the left side, the things that happen when we're chronically in a state of stress, heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, um, our muscles tense, um, our, uh, cortisol and adrenaline levels are high. So oftentimes I'm working with folks as well on how do we engage that parasympathetic nervous system more often. Maybe that's spending time outside, maybe that's going for a walk, um, maybe it's a warm shower or bath, uh, reading, whatever it is, um, we want to engage that side of our nervous system um, on a, a as regular a basis as we can because um, because what we're dealing with with the liver disease or with um, the chronic illness is usually engaging that, that stress response side. Um, I try not to do a talk uh, about any of this without uh, acknowledging uh, the role of our caregivers. Um, this is a huge part of this process, the support team. Um, 
folks can't go through this process without uh, the support of family, friends, loved ones. Um, and so I want caregivers always to know that we're talking to you as well when we're talking about self-care and, and coping and management of this process because um, in some ways this is, uh, this is equally as challenging for you, if not more so than for, for our patients. And so if you're not taking care of yourself, then um, that has a ripple effect on, on everything that's going on um, in this situation. And so always just a shout out to the caregivers. And um, I think at UC as well, we're trying to do a better job of making sure we're supporting everyone in the, in the system and not, not only the patient, but the whole unit. Um, so that being said, you know, we want you to let us know if there's anything that we can help with. So I've talked a lot and quickly about um, the, the prevalence of, of depression and anxiety and mental health um, concerns as, as folks go through the liver transplant process. So what, what can we do about this? So first off, um, we want you to talk to providers, talk to me, talk to your social workers, talk to your doctors, nurses, and let them know if you're noticing any of these symptoms that we're talking about that way that we can step in early and often to address. And oftentimes when we do, um, we have good result and those things can be resolved fairly quickly. Um, I'm always talking with patients about exercise. Exercise is such a good um, um, coping strategy for mental health, um, whether you know we're talking about dealing with chronic illness or not. Um, and of course that may look differently when you're, um, sick with the liver disease or when you're in the recovery process. I'm talking, you know, maybe we're just talking about moving around the house a little bit more, short walks down the driveway, um, just just getting things moving a little bit goes a long way. And so adding uh, an exercise, uh, a regular exercise routine in is something that I'm always talking with folks about um, in terms of addressing the mental health side of transplant. Utilizing your support system is huge. Finding that family member, that friend um, who you know you can go to and talk to when you're feeling down or the one who you can go to and will make you laugh and totally distract you, um, that's, that's what we're looking for too. Um, it, takes, it takes a whole um, system to have the best outcome. And so identifying who those people are for you is important. Attending support groups, things like this, it's huge. Again, I know it's also limited with COVID. Um, we're trying to figure out ways to um, make this type of support available to our patients, um, even uh, in the midst of this. Um, but uh, talking with folks who understand what you're going through, like in a forum uh, such as this, it's, it's huge. Um, learning new te techniques, relaxation, mindfulness, meditation, um, anything that, like we were saying, is going to engage that relaxation response. Um, those are the types of things that um, I want folks to be utilizing on a regular basis as you're are dealing with the, the stress of this process and as you move through all stages of liver transplant. A lot of folks really find journaling super helpful and therapeutic. Um, I'm all, always talking about to folks about having structure in your day and creating a little bit of a routine, even when time kind of feels, um, you know, like it's whether you're in the waiting period or the recovery period, like it's hard to kind of nail down. And then of course, seek treatment with the mental health provider. Um, we're trying to do a better job, again, of, of acknowledging the challenges that come along with this process um, from a mental health standpoint as well. Um, and so please um, talk to your providers. Um, we are here, uh, we wanna help you. And, um, and that is, um, I think my quick talk. Any questions for me? I can't see anyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. We're actually going to go back to gallery view here and open up the floor for any questions. Well, I feel like I'm monopolizing the microphone, but it's dangerous when you give me an open mic. I do have so many questions, but. Um, I think it's important that we act like COVID never existed because that has put such a, a different angle on, on us as transplant recipients, right? I mean, we used to be able to, to visit people and, and have people into our homes and all that kind of stuff. I think some of the work that Don does with his 
support group uh, video chats and things like that help us get along and certainly things like this go along um, and, and, and help us. But I seem to recognize an increase in a lack of patience with individuals over time as we have gone through our transplant years, meaning the others, right? You know, uh, our fatigue. Well, I, I can't hang out with you until 11 o'clock or um, I can't go on that trip with you. God forbid I ever get on another cruise, but you know, that's that kind of stuff. Is there a, an appropriate response, COVID or otherwise, when, you know, without hurting someone's feelings or rejecting a friendship or a relationship where you say, guys, I'm, I'm sorry, you just don't get it because I've tried that. And the response has been even increased distancing. Well, and I would, that's a great question, John. And I would love to hear if um, some of the other group members have any thoughts on that. Um, but I do think it's about, it becomes about setting being able to set boundaries for yourself and being able to know that um, that may cause some changes in some relationships, um, but that the priority has to be your, your health. Um, and if, if they can't appreciate that or don't understand that, then, um, then it may look a little bit different moving forward. And, and again, I know that's hard, but, um, I would hope that uh, that the folks who have been with you and walked with you through this would understand that you know some things change when you go through something like this, and and that has to be okay. Nobody else has any questions. You brought up sleep. Um, you know, we're all we're all family. The transplant recipients, Judy, Don, Bob, Bill, all of us. Um, you know, sleep is never the same post transplant. You know, you're up, you're down, you're you're two hours here, forty five minutes there. Uh, is that normal post transplant? Is that medication? Is it? I mean, uh, I'm just kind of opening it up. Yeah, and maybe Tiffany has some thoughts on this too. I I hear a, a lot of folks. I'm, I'm certainly working with a lot of folks on sleep issues um, in the post-transplant period. I would assume that there are some folks who don't have that, um, don't have that issue, but I do think it's a side, it can be a side effect of some of the medications. Um, and again, um, just, I mean, it's a huge life event. And, and in those situations, um, sometimes the way that we, um, uh, kind of move through our circadian rhythm and, and the 24 hour cycle can be a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I would say I, I hear it frequently. You're certainly not, um, not alone in that. If, I don't know if you have any other thoughts, Tiffany. Um, yeah, I agree with what you say. And I think like all things, we need to approach it or think about it as multifactorial. Um, in terms of medications, I, most of the patients after time after transplant, you're on to Corolimus and mycophenolate, let's say in general, I know there's others. Um, and, you know, sleep isn't necessary, or insomnia or lack of sleep isn't necessarily a side effect listed as, you know, something that was studied with it or found when they studied it. However, it could be possible. Um, I think, you know, the talks that we heard tonight can also contribute, right? Your nutrition, um, could potentially impact your sleep. Your mental health could impact your sleep. I mean, I think there are a lot of things um, and areas that you have to try to look at. I don't know that there's one set thing, in my opinion, um, that can impact lack of sleep. But I agree, as Alex said, many, many patients that I you know, work with definitely have um, insomnia issues. I feel like it's much worse after, right after transplant for a lot, and then it gets better. But I also have people that have it, like you said, it never goes back to normal. Some that people have had the it their steroids. whole lives, right? <laughs> yeah, steroids. absolutely. We were, well, we were living on 30 minutes of sleep a night, wondering why everybody else was dying. Correct. Correct. And, you know, sometimes patients who had sleep problems before transplant, you know, a new liver doesn't necessarily make that better either. So, you know, again, I think it's really multiple things probably contributing. 
Hey, John, on the on the uh, friend on the friend issue, one thing that that I've noticed post transplant anyway is is again I had some mild depression episodes, nothing like the pre transplant, but I had some mild afterwards. But friends had a and family too had a hard time understanding that I'm just not elated all the time because I've got this transplant. They don't understand the the ups and downs and the cycles and you know when our unexpected you know health conditions may pop up how that kind of triggers some of that trauma from before the transplant you know oh no am I going back down this same cycle again but I found about four good friends that that really get that and that that tends to be my social circle now is 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 a lot more constricted. Than it was before, um, you know. I don't feel like, and, and again, in my poems, I call that false beauty, where I had to kind of put on a happy face, even though I was feeling kind of miserable on the inside. And with these people, I don't have to do that. And uh, you know, that's that's very liberating. Mm. Can I say something? Don Don is doing um, Zoom meetings of people from the support group, but it seems to be the same people. We aren't getting any new, hardly any new transplants. Um, and it's a shame that none of those people are getting any of the experience of a support group that actually meets together. Um, because the, um, you know, before it was run by the social and they sent out letters and they, you know, there were flyers everywhere and you all promoted it. Is there any way to let people know that we are still doing it, but then don't? Anybody? Are, are you asking if there's a way that, that UC could promote it? Um, promote our support group more aggressively? Yeah. What do you think, Don? Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, I was just going to, I know Lynn's on the call. I was going to see if she had any thoughts um, because she's um, uh, hooked into the Facebook group uh, a little bit more closely than I am. Um, if, if we had any thoughts about how we would get the word out, um, because I know we talked, we've talked about it. It's the, it's something that folks are missing right now. Um, and we're struggling to figure out how to supplement that. I mean, I think many of you have, have listened to my podcasts and my Sunday morning posts. This is deeply personal for so differently, so differently for so many people. And, you know, I, I'm an open book, Don, Judy, but we're all open books to the support group. And I don't know if that's the same for everybody. You know, they, they might, it, it might, they might be, I don't think introverted is the right word, but they might not want to share their experiences like, like we do. They might not look to a support mechanism as a, as a way to, um, to live post-transplant. Just, just one comment, um, you know, again, not to blame it with COVID, but you know, some of the things that we've done in our processes obviously have had to change. One of those is, you know, we used to have our listing class where all the patients would come in, we would talk to them on those videos, there's information in the pamphlet or in the folder, there's information about the support group. So what we had to do during these times was we weren't bringing patients in, we're not holding that big class with the patients and their families. So we've recorded all of the um, education, we're sending it to people when they're listed and asking them, please watch the video following up, did you watch the video? Whether or not they're watching it, the message is different. So, you know, I kind of, I appreciate what you're saying. And, you know, in a way, not even promoting it per se, but just reminding it or letting people know that it is a resource available. So, you know, potentially in clinic and when we see patients early after transplant, you know, I think reminding them, Anna, maybe when you guys check them out or different things, just, you know, reminding them that that's there. Um, you know, I remind people sometimes, you know, there are some video education or things like that, but, you know, the way that we're delivering some of the education has had to change, um, you know, over this time. So that could be maybe one of the reasons some of the newer people aren't there um, 
you know, just a, just a thought and potentially a suggestion of how we can, you know, make sure others know the resources available. I have noticed that there are fewer individuals in our Facebook group that are on the waiting list. Um, there, there's a lot less questions that when, when I started, I know Bob, um, and, and I'm thinking that that has to be helpful. You know, you got to have so many questions going through your head that you'd like to hear from people that went through the same situation. But uh, COVID, I like I said at the beginning, COVID has just, it's changed everything. You know, I think, um, so I'm, I'm Corey, for those that don't know me, um, and I'm the administrator of the program. And I think Tiffany brings up a good point. And, and I'm taking notes too, because maybe during this time we can uh, educate patients a little bit differently. I mean, Tiffany's right. We had to change a lot of things, a lot of our processes because of uh, the pandemic and us not wanting to bring everybody into a one room together. And, um, you know, but but I, I, I that was the first thing that came to my mind too, is a lot of our changes have, have meant that um, something that we do say in the video, it's different to have it on a hour long video that we're asking people to go on YouTube and watch versus sitting in a room and saying, you know what, we have the support group and it's great. And, and you know, um, talk about it there um, and have that interaction and that communication. Um, and, and, you know, uh, it, I'm, I'm taking notes because, you know, first of all, I hope that this, this pandemic is over uh, soon, but even if it's not, I think we can change some of our communication as well. Um, John, you, you brought up a good point about our wait list. I guess <laughs> the, the, the funny good thing is uh, we're transplanting people very quickly. So uh, people, as soon as they're usually on the wait list, they're being transplanted fairly quickly. So I guess it's a good problem for us to have, but uh, I, don't, I don't know that we're capturing, to your point, the people that are, might be then post-transplant because we are transplanting quite a few. And I think the yeah. post-transplant, the newly post-transplant could really benefit from this group from the Facebook site, from the, the you know, Lynn and Stephanie's and, and uh, the, the patient support groups. And, and so uh, we need to kind of go back to the drawing board on a few things and see how we can engage those, those patients. So Corey, your, your numbers are actually up, right? I mean, COVID yeah. hasn't really, hasn't really taken what I would have thought would have been a huge dip. So interesting you say that, John, uh, our numbers are up. Um, where uh, we've actually, as of today, matched uh, transplants we did two years ago for the entire year. We did 115 transplants in calendar year 18. We've done 115 transplants year to date right now. Even with COVID, we were finding that, uh, that there were plenty of good organs available and we were helping a lot of patients. And so um, we are still expecting to probably end up with more transplants than we did all of last year. At least that's our pace that we're kind of on right now. So uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's COVID hasn't really affected us on the liver side for transplants. If anything, we might've uh, taken some organs that maybe some competing transplant centers might've taken. I know that uh, knock on wood, Cincinnati hadn't been hit as hard as say Detroit. And while Detroit is worried about uh, staffing their ICUs with, with COVID patients, we weren't dealing with that. And so we were able to take some organs maybe from that Detroit might've gotten. And there's some decent programs up in the Detroit area. Um, they might've gotten these, but they couldn't because there was no place to put them post-transplant. Um, so, you know, I guess it benefited us and, and uh, we've actually been uh, doing fairly well in the year. Okay, can I say a couple things? Uh, number one, I still haven't gotten my liver. I just keep getting cancer. Uh, I feel like an outsider still to the group because I'm not there. Uh, but it's only been seven months. It feels like it's been seven years, but it's only been seven months. And now they're talking about next spring, I may get one. Uh, my cancer just keeps coming back. But I understand what John is saying because a lot of my friends who, well, I had to retire because of all this, uh, we're just fading away. We can't have lunch together anymore, things like that. But I'm starting to get more fatigue. 
I don't know why I just end up having to take two naps a day. If I do something, I traveled down here to Tennessee. It took me two days to recuperate just sitting in a car for six hours. So I'm hoping to get better, you know, but uh, like the least, you know, my youngest grandkids only two and a half years old. So I like to see, you know, and my 50th anniversary is still next June. So that's my goal that I'm trying to go. And then my doctor, Dr. Kaufman says, well, if I get a liver, I won't be able to have a, a party. So, but uh, I'm still working on it, but yeah, I still do party. feel like an outsider because I'm not in the club as I would call it. I'm not in the club, but there are so many questions I would love to be able to talk to people about. I did not know John had a podcast, uh, you know, things like that, but uh, that's my two cents worth. Well, well, Bob, I, I don't like the way that sounds, that you don't feel like part of the group. I mean, the fact that you're on the transplant list, I think, means you're not only part of the group, but you're, you're just not as an experienced member of the group. But that certainly doesn't mean that you're not um, a full-fledged member of the group. I mean, you um, called us one time when you were driving down Tennessee. And I, I think all the members of the group knows that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, but then, like I told Don, I, I keep forgetting now. I try yeah. not to think about my problems. You know, I just try not to, you know. And uh, that's why I told Don he's probably going to have to yell at me a couple of times to remind me of this. So I had I two alarms you. set for this one. <laughs> Yes, and I had two alarms for this one, so uh, <laughs> and I'm glad I did. I, I learned a lot off of this, so but uh, that's how I feel, you know, because I'm not there yet. Maybe within, you know, and then some of the pictures I see, some of our wives take some interesting pictures of us in bed, you know, in the hospital, and that scares the crap out of me. But uh, I don't know what I'm getting into. And I'm a very control, as most people know, I'm military. I'm very controlling. I got to control stuff. I control, you know, and there's so many unknowns. And I don't like that. So, but uh, what can I say? You know, I have found friends. I found friends who knows family people. So that's been interesting. So, uh, but uh, I would encourage you, Bob, um, in our in our support group, you can instant message any one of us um, if you want to talk about anything or if you have questions about, you know, what to expect or uh, how is this going. Um, I think we're a pretty, pretty open group and the folks that want to talk are certainly uh, happy uh, to do so, whether it's on the phone or setting up a, a, a FaceTime video or things like that. I sent a, a chat to Teresa. Um, you brought up um, an issue of being a veteran and my, my work with the VA system and their electronic medical record system called Vista. They do have an app. Are you using Patient Viewer to look at your labs and your your uh, messaging oh, yeah. back and oh, forth yeah. with the physicians? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My doctors are on the outside. I do not call doctors who actually have the cancer. So keep everyone in, but I see only the I am one of the people that you see hands in the place like that. Three, four years. Yet to be I don't. I am in government. And we lost him. We lost him. Yeah. I. Maybe he's coming back. It, is he with the VA down here in Nashville? Is that what he's doing? Coming down here. I think he has a place. To, I think family down there. Oh, okay. I didn't know if he was like talking to Vanderbilt or something with the VA oh. group here. Because <laughs> I'm in Nashville. That's that's the only reason I asked. There you are, Bob. You're back. Yeah, but you need to unmute the phone. 
can't hear you. Can you unmute your phone? Oh, it muted go. on its own. It muted on its own. Uh, no, I'm up here at Dayton. I live in Centerville, so I go to the Dayton VA in my okay. cat. Okay. And uh, so I like uh, going halfway down. I don't like going into Cincinnati. It's a, you know, just don't like that area. But oh, okay. uh, no, my daughter came to college down here and she just stayed. So we come down here. Okay. Uh, that's about it. All right. Well, are there any other questions? If not, I, Car Corey, did you want to say anything else? This was the time I was going to introduce you, but you kind of started. So I don't know. Yeah, you know, um, and, and so I, first of all, I appreciate the American Liver Foundation uh, working with us on this event. I think, uh, as you can see, we have a very engaged uh, group of, of patients. And, and, you know, I, I also, myself as the administrator, I, I guess I'm blessed to have such a great team uh, with me. I, I know that Dr. G, Dr. Kaiser, Lisa, Lynn, Anna, I mean, there's many, many more that are on our team. And, and, and it, it, they, they're truly the ones that make this all happen. Um, I know everyone loves Dr. Shaw, but we have a lot more people besides Dr. Shaw on this team. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and it, it's truly a remarkable team that we have. And, and I'm, I'm truly blessed uh, to be working with such a great team um, it allows me to eat bonbons on my desk and not have to, you know, do too much work because they're, they're taking care of everything. But, uh, you know, if I haven't met you yet, I, I hope to meet you at a, at a future engagement. I'm very involved with, uh, Life Center. I'm very involved in, um, um, obviously anything that we can do to get the, the word of organ donation out there. Uh, so you might see me at some of those events. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I hope that, Hopefully very soon, I, the people I don't know, I'm, I'm able to, uh, to meet in person. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like a, a stranger is just a friend I haven't met yet. Um, and uh, I guess I guess my segue on that is is uh, introducing you uh, to Don, uh, who's who's probably just as passionate about organ transplant and liver transplantation as I am. And uh I think uh, Don uh, was going to share a, a story really quick, uh, and, and I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting Don and, and knowing how passionate he is about this, and, and it, it's really remarkable to me. You know, I talked about the engagement of our, of our liver transplant patients, and, and for Bob, you know, I, hopefully, uh, you know, you're able to, to uh, get involved with this group because I, I was uh, simply amazed with at the events I've been to that Lynn and Stephanie really put forward and amazed at how the patients help each other. You know, you have people like Don, who I think, Don, keep me honest, eight years post-transplant? Eight years Monday was my eighth year. <laughs> and, and it's amazing how how the team of patients, I, I, I sat back, you know, I know Lynn and Stephanie do a lot for it, but, you know, I kind of watched them kind of step back as patients helped patients. Patients were able to say, these are what I went through. And is anyone else experiencing it? And then someone says, yes, I've experienced it. And this is what I found works. And, and it's simply an amazing team. And I know Don is very involved. And, you know, I get, I get a call from Don probably on a every other week basis, just saying, Corey, I have an idea. And here's my idea that I have for you. And, you know, we did a, we did a flag raising ceremony in Westchester uh, earlier this year, uh, a bit virtual because of the pandemic. This was Don uh, coming to me last year and saying, I have an idea of what we need to do for Westchester Hospital. It's part of our system and uh, we don't do, even though we don't do transplants there, it's a, it's a big uh, hospital in our system. So, you know, Don, some of my, some of my great ideas, I'm gonna say this in front of my team, but some of my great ideas are actually Don's ideas and I just uh, oh. put them forward. So, uh, <laughs> Don, uh, I've, I've actually, like I said, had the pleasure of meeting a while ago and. I really enjoy the involvement that Don has for our transplant program as well as fellow patients. So Don, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, Corey. I, I'll send you the $25 tomorrow morning <laughs> for the intro you gave me. No, but uh, I was asked to say a few words. I was going to tell my story. Everyone knows my story. 
uh, but I was eight, Monday was eight years. And I was really uh, surprised Dr. Shaw made a comment on my post on the transplant page. And he mentioned that uh, since that, that day, they've done 780 liver transplants here in Cincinnati. And I know that year they only did about 40 and uh, we've come a long way. But what I just wanted to really summarize that, you know, we've heard a lot of things about meds, about the differences we've heard about nutrition and to eat healthy. And there's all kinds of things out there to help us. But the most important thing that we have to help us is the staff. And I, I know there's not one staff member that if you have a question, wouldn't go out of their way to find the answer if they don't already know it. And you know, we, I, I get a lot of questions. What can I take for this cold? Or can I take this for a cold? Or you know, what about eating this? And uh, the, the resources are there, but there's a couple of highlights of things that were said. I was disappointed uh, on the nutrition part that I've always told patients, you need to have ice cream and pie <laughs> when you're recuperating for all the people that are gonna come visit you. But I'm gonna change it now to sugarless ice cream and sugar-free <laughs> pie and I'm for that. And then I was glad to hear that uh, ProGraph causes hair loss because I'm sure that a lot of my gray is due to the hair that grew, grew because I'm on cyclosporin and not ProGraph. And uh, but the, on the support group, uh, I, may, I am gonna do one uh, next Wednesday and I think it'll probably be at 6.30ish. And I have a couple ideas that maybe might get some new people involved, I'll try it. And I may need your help, John, on helping me with this one, but... Uh, we could talk about that offline, but I think the most important thing is that I know having my transplant, one of the things I had a lot of complications and I felt as though that, and I don't care who you believe in, but I believe in God and I believe that I'm still here to do something and that's to give back. And that's something I've always tried to do. And I know we've heard things about being depressed or down and uh, I've had those days, but I look around and I realize the gift that I was given, I can find something good today to do with it. And uh, you know, I've tried for the last eight years to give back and I'm gonna continue to give back as much as I can. And uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's my takeaway. I've tried to get involved with the American Liver Foundation. Uh, I've gotten involved with our transplant group and Donate Life and um, you know, I do a lot, but I do it because I care about everyone I've met. And because of my transplant, I've been lucky to meet all of you. And I'm thankful for that. And I always will be. But uh, the one last thing, tomorrow night, uh, American Liver Foundation for their virtual, virtual liver walk is liver jeopardy or something. And so there's a <laughs> program tomorrow night. You know, Try to get online. If you're unsure, go to the American Liver Foundation. You can find out more information about it. But um, I encourage you to join in tomorrow night on the program. And other than that, I'm going to, we've been on a long time. And uh, so I'm going to say thank you to everyone that was on here this evening and I look forward to talking with everyone next, uh, next Wednesday at our support group Zoom meeting. But I'm going to turn it back to Teresa. Hey guys, thanks. And, and I know we're running over, so I, I want to be really quick on the next couple of things that I need to share with you. I did, and, and I'm sorry that um, Bob got off because I had something I wanted to share and maybe you guys can help him know about this, but um, the, um, let's see, I want to, um, Okay, I'm screen sharing, but it's not turning. There it goes. Um, there, there is a um, thing for liver cancer patients. There's a conference um, and it is the 16th and 17th from 11 to two um, via Zoom. So I, we need to let him know about that. If you somebody can send him that and say, hey, you need that. to kind of do that. And I, I'll try to send him an email with, the, um, with it on it. But 
that's something that I thought was important for especially anybody that has been dealing with cancer or, or needs to know about that. Um, the other thing was a thanks to our sponsors, Bayer and Salix. Um, I have one more Zoomy giveaway to give away and I put everybody's name back in the pot and I'm gonna pull and it's for Flavors Cutting Board and Judy, you won. So Damn I will it. be shipping that to you um, and you'll have to cook something on it and send me a picture or something with that. Um, the other thing I just wanna thank um, UC Health for working with us on this and hopefully we can do one of these or at least once or twice a year. Um, because I think it's important to try to get as many of the transplant or pre-transplant patients involved. Um, I know COVID is an awful thing and it's very hard because you can't get together with people. Um, but I think this is the way we're going to have to do this probably through at least the summer of next year, if not through the fall of next year, um, until we get, you know, that vaccine and it's up and working for everybody, um, it's just too dangerous for you guys. And we wanna make sure that we keep you healthy. So this is the way we're doing it. Um, I, I know it's not always the best, but we really do try to make it as fun as we can and have as interesting speakers as we can. So thank you for attending. If you need to engage with us, um, we're on Facebook, we're on um, Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube. And then I also put UC Health's um, email address there. So our, or not, website address there so that you all know that. But I thank you guys for doing this and, and giving us the opportunity to work with you on this. Um, and if there's anything else you need from me, um, you know how to get in touch with me, I think. Yes, John, go ahead. Um, are you gonna send us attendees a link to the recorded video so we can have access to the slides that the three- um, the That's my panels. next sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got it before it came out of my mouth. Um, we're going to send the, the recording um, and an evaluation form. If you could like fill out the evaluation form and let me know what kind of things that you'd like to hear about, um, you know, that maybe there's some other things that kind of came to your mind today that you're like, well, we really need to talk about this. But let us know. This is going to be on YouTube. So if you know other people that need to watch it, you can send the link to them and have them watch it. But it'll be up there for a while. It may be tomorrow afternoon before you get the link and everything, but we'll try to get that to you along with that evaluation form. So please take time to, to let out for the people that won things tonight. I'll be shipping it out um, this week or this weekend. And um, the walk is going on. So make sure you check with Don and, and Judy about joining the team. And I really thank you guys for coming out tonight. I know it's, um, it's a you, lot Lisa. to do on a Wednesday night. Um, I thank used to everybody. do choir on Wednesday night, so I don't, I don't have choir anymore. So this is 